Hey, and welcome to TYT Interviews. I am your host today, Malcolm Flesher, and with me is Jennifer Manukin, who is the Dean of the UCLA School of Law. And we're going, I'm going to explain what she's here uh, in a moment. We had uh, Susan Sarandon in earlier, and then we had Joss Whedon. But now, the main event. I'm in good company today. Yeah, what can I me, say? You and me, you and me. So, uh, as I said, uh, uh, Jennifer is the Dean of the UCLA School of Law, and today we're going to talk about why uh, hopelessly faulty scientific, forensic science is being, is being used as evidence in uh, courtrooms across the country to convict people who are possibly innocent, possibly guilty, but we don't know based on the evidence, uh, the forensic evidence, because it's not real science. And uh, so we'll get into that in a minute, but first, thank you for coming on to uh, TYT Interviews to speak with me. Thank you so much for having me. I'm delighted to be here. So uh, let me just get a little bit of background on how you got involved in criminal justice issues. I mean, I don't know what a dean at a law school does, really. I imagine it's pretty cushy. You get tenure, right? You get tenure? I do. I have tenure, tenure. And then after that, it's just, you know, you go to the beach, hang out, it's Los Angeles. Uh, something like that. Something like not, that. So that's not, not, quite, that's not the case, really? Not, not, <laughs> so what, what does the dean at the uh, prestigious school of law do? So, so as dean, I mostly am kind of the public face of the law school, and I also get to help run the show on the inside. So I spend a lot of time getting to know our alums and working with them, and also spending time with students and my faculty trying to make the law school um, even better than it already is. Okay. But before I was dean, I was a professor, and I still am. Mm -hmm. uh, and I taught at UCLA for about a, 10 years before I became dean, and before that I taught at the University. University of Virginia Law School, and my main research area was evidence, especially expert and scientific evidence. So that's really, um, I'm I'm an I'm an evidence expert. So when I you guess. say when you say evidence, what does that mean generally speaking for people people at home who uh, are not who haven't been you know in a court of law for face charges like I have many times? Yes, right, uh, exactly. I'm, <laughs> we're not going to talk about your personal no. experiences here, um, but uh, but but when you when you do face. Uh, trial, either in a civil or a criminal case, there's a pretty complicated body of rules that govern what you are allowed to bring in front of the jury or, or the judge mm -hmm. in a bench trial. And so as an evidence teacher, I focus on teaching my students about those rules. And as an evidence scholar, I work on thinking about what those rules should look like, how we ought to um, think about the evidence that we bring into court. And that has changed over the years, I assume? Whether, you know, what evidence is admissible is not the same necessarily today as it was 50 years ago or 100 years ago, or is it the same? In, in some very broad ways, it's similar. Some of the big principles um, haven't changed that much, but a lot of the particulars do. And even some of the ideas about it change, too. So, for example, our ideas about expert evidence and how to think about the introduction of expert evidence in mm. court have changed a little bit. Uh, and we'll get into that. That's what we're going to talk about. But is it still, is it, we still call it like Exhibit A, Exhibit B. We do. You what happens still... if you get to Z? What, what do you start at double A? What do you... <laughs> there you go. You could get, you, you actually usually probably number your exhibits. Oh, okay. So, so, so when numbers keep going and I've going. already learned something right. there important you go. today. So, okay, so the reason I uh, wanted to do this interview with Jennifer specifically is a report that came out from, uh, I'm going to get this, the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology. And Jennifer wrote, uh, you advised the this group, or, well, I, we'll get into it, but okay. my point, <laughs> important point here is that I read an article that you wrote in the Washington Post about how certain kinds of evidence, uh, uh, you know, uh, shoe impression evidence, hair matches, uh, 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 what else? Bite marks. Oh, bite marks. The, the firearms are, identification. Firearms identification. These are we associate with forensic science, and we call it science, and we've seen it on CSI and that type, uh, how it's actually faulty, and I have a couple of quotes I want to, uh, or one, one quote from the article that I want to share with the audience. Uh, so if you can bring that up, Griffin, please. Uh, the report builds upon mounting evidence that certain types of forensic feature comparison methods may not be as reliable as they have long appeared. A recent unprecedented joint study by the Innocence Project and the FBI looked at decades of testimony by hair examiners in criminal cases and found flaws in the testimony in astonishing 95% of the time. Uh, in a number of serious felonies, DNA testing has revealed that bite mark evidence underpinning convictions was simply incorrect. More generally, faulty forensic evidence has been found in roughly half of all cases in which post-conviction DNA testing has led to exoneration. Okay, so that means that we are putting a lot of people away based on scientific evidence that does not hold up under 
scientific scrutiny. That's exactly right. I mean, there's all of these kinds of evidence that have been in use for a really long time, but when we look closely, it turns out that they haven't actually been scientifically validated. So it might turn out that some of them are pretty good. It may turn out that some of them are no good at all, but the, the problem is we don't know enough. But about that's it. like, I mean, that, for people who watch CSI or forensic files or these shows on TV who are used to DNA analysis, and DNA, that's it's different from DNA analysis like uh, semen or blood stains, things like that. Uh, but we, we conflate the two, or these, we sort of lump them all in together as forensic science. Right, and CSI makes it look really glossy and fancy and certain and absolutely true. And in the real world, it's often a lot more complicated than that. Right, we'll see, in the real cases from like the show Forensic Files I've seen before, they'll show a bite mark on an arm and then they'll show sort of the an impression and superimpose one on the other and it's a perfect match and so obviously guilty, you know, off to jail. Well, that actually isn't so different from what's been happening in some courtrooms. I mean, it's that same kind of comparing of an impression. But that looks really persuasive. But at the same time, what you really have to ask is how many other people might have left a bite mark right. that would also look pretty darn similar. And if the answer is a great many, then that seemingly very powerful evidence may not be so powerful. Right, but you're not seeing a thousand other bite marks comparing and saying, oh, it could have been any one of these 50 people, right. really. That's right. Uh -huh. And we have no statistics. We can't actually give you a number. So, so why do we call it science if it's not really, you know, we, we call it forensic science and we introduce it in court as science. Uh, how did it come to be perceived this way and nobody said, hey, hang on a second, that's actually not really science. Well, so it's, I mean, it's a great question. And I mean, if I, w wanted to, if I were going to give you the cynical answer, I would say, well, partly precisely for that reason. Science is a very powerful word. You say that it's scientific and people hear authoritative, mm -hmm. true, certain. Um, Unless you're a member of the Republican uh, yeah, congressional well, delegation. <laughs> right, we won't, we, we won't go into that, but fair enough. Um, but, but so I think that there is a power to the use of the word science. But I also think that um, in a way, some of the forensic sciences uh, fit with late 19th century and turn of the century ideas about scientific looking, careful observation as a method for knowing. But they don't necessarily fit in with contemporary ideas of how we'd validate something by actually learning how often are you getting it wrong? What's the error rate? How certain is this knowledge? So part of the story here is that the early kinds of forensic science, especially things like fingerprint examination, um, came into court as part of an idea about observation. Just like every snowflake was different, it probably was the case that every fingerprint was different too. And that kind of analogy had power. And when, when the early experts testified, they testified on the basis of those kind of cultural ideal, ideas that had some power, but they weren't really tested. And it just, uh, once it's introduced, we all sort of accept it. And, but, but even fingerprint analysis, which we still think of as pretty relatively foolproof, is not foolproof. Yes, so I've spent a lot of time working on fingerprint identification. And um, for a long time in court, fingerprint examiners would testify in the language of absolute certainty. They would say that their error rate was zero, that they never made a mistake, that they could identify your thumb to the exclusion of every other thumb in the known universe. And when they were saying those things, the truth is that we didn't actually have the valid science to support those claims. But judges let them in and juries convicted on that basis. Fingerprint evidence has gone further than some of the other forensic sciences in recent years in at least trying to investigate So rolling it back some the claim. where they're not saying this is this fingerprint is only is you and you did this even though you were nowhere near the crime scene. In my opinion, they're still using language that's a little bit too strong, but it's much rarer now for them to come into court and say, the error rate is zero. We've never made a mistake. Mm -hmm. They've at least often softened their language a little bit, and they've also begun to do studies to try to look at how often they might be getting it wrong. Okay, so tell me about the report then. So who who are the people in this report who are participating in putting this report? I mean, it's, it's sizable. Yes, it's a big report. I brought <laughs> yeah. it as, as a, I, a gift for you. You? Oh, thank you. That's, That's right. I, Bedtime reading. Yeah, I, I've <laughs> so, got through three quarters of it, and then right. I skipped to the end to find out how it, uh, how it there ended. There you go. Um, right. uh, but so why was this report put together? Who, what was the impetus for it? And who were who were the scientists who were, you know, I mean, 
aren't they the same scientists who are conducting these tests? No, they really no, aren't. No, they're not. And okay, that's, good. Um, that's so, good. So, so let's go back a few years before this report. Um, there was an earlier report that was that came out under the auspices of the National Academy of Sciences in 2009 that also looked at the forensic science community. And that earlier report found that there were significant issues about exactly the things that we're talking about. That that there was overclaiming, that there wasn't enough underlying scientific rigor to some of the claims that were made, and that there wasn't enough funding and research to support these sorts of things. Um, but that earlier report didn't really say too much about what should happen in the courtroom. Mm -hmm. I think a fair reading of it would have said that we should be very wary about using many of these kinds of evidence, but it didn't quite come out and say that directly. It did say that we should create a new federal agency to try to deal with these things, and that early report got a fair amount of attention, and some things changed, but not much. We okay. certainly didn't create a federal agency. Judges kept on, for the most part, admitting these kinds of evidence as if nothing had changed. Um, and, and in some fields, they began to do a little bit more research, but not that much. And this report, in some ways, seems to me like the, the, the next phase in this conversation. Um, PCAST is the President's Council of Advisors on Science, Science and Technology. They are some of the most distinguished scientists in this country. But they have nothing to do ne necessarily with forensic science. None of them are practicing forensic okay. scientists, not a one. Some of the forensic scientists say, well, then why should we care what they say? Mm -hmm. But the answer is that these are people whose ideas about what it means to be scientifically valid should count for a lot. Right. Um, fundamental ideas about scientific validity don't really change from field to field. They're, they're a little bit more, more general and broad than that. And so PCAST got interested in looking at forensic science and trying to see what the state of the science really was. Um, and and they, they formed a working group. And that working group created a group of advisors, a group of senior advisors that were mostly judges and a few law professor deans like me. And I was co-chair of that advisory group. Uh -huh. So I didn't write this report, right. but I did get to you did read it. Though. I did get to read it Lucky and comment you. on it. I, yes, exactly. I, <laughs> I, I really, I recommend it. Every page, it's, uh, it's, it's scientilating. True. It is. Well, right. I mean, it is, the reality actually, is, it's, it's but, horrifying, right. actually. Uh, parts of it are horrifying because what they found, and these again are some of the nation's most distinguished scientists, and what they found is that most of these kinds of forensic science that they looked at really haven't proven their fundamental validity. Right, so I mean the bottom line is, you know, it's, we're speaking about it in sort of an academic terms. We have a lot of scientists, well, we'll judge the science, and well, we think the science is this, and we think it's that. The bottom line is that there are a lot of people who have been sent to prison for long prison terms yes. who are most likely well, unquestionably, a significant portion of them are, are innocent of the crimes that they are convicted of. Yes. In fact, uh, of the DNA exonerations, that is, the several hundred people who have now been exonerated thanks to DNA testing that typically wasn't available at the time, in about half of those cases, it turns out that faulty forensic science was one of the ingredients that, proved that, that, that created their conviction. Maybe not the only one, maybe not even the most important one, but in a number of cases, the forensic science evidence was really front and center. It was the thing that sent them to prison, right. and it turns out it was wrong, and they were innocent. So, so real lives are at stake. So when you're watching CSI, right, be... Take it with a giant yeah. grain of salt. Uh, so, okay, well, the, if the science has been demonstrated to be invalid, and we've known it for a number of years now, and there's always been sort of uh, a a cloud over it to a degree, I suppose. How come, what is it systematically so, that uh, allows judges, or why do judges systematically continually allow these type of evidence introduced that they know is going to sway juries, that they know juries are going to be find yeah. persuasive because they've seen CSI. So, so and because there's a guy in a lab coat telling him, I mean, if a guy's got a lab coat on, he's got to be. Right, he must right. be, right, exactly. We better believe him. So he's an I, expert. I, 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 that's exactly right. So I want to make, I'm going to be a little pointy headed about one thing. One of the, one, a lot of these science, the, these underlying techniques haven't necessarily been proven invalid. Right. They just haven't been proven valid. And so my big argument, and something I've said several times as a scholar, and which I would say here again today, is that we ought to be using valid scientific evidence in court. If the answer is we don't know whether it's valid, well, let's try to find out first, rather than using it and hoping for the best. I mean, we don't know that astrology is valid or invalid, but we wouldn't use we, astrology we, in a court of law. We wouldn't use astrology in a court of law. And some of these kinds of evidence, 
I suspect won't be able to establish their validity. Others may well be able to, but we ought to test it. We ought to be able to have the answer to how often are you getting this wrong right. in similar cases. And so, and you know, also there might be some validity to bite mark analysis, but you would have there right now it's sort of the old wild west. They can do whatever they want and claim. Yeah, that personally, they, I think bite marks should be excluded. Okay. I think we actually have enough evidence that bite marks are a sufficiently weak form of proof that they should be entirely thrown out. But we need greater structure um, around we need a lot what more is admissible, what's not now, admissible, and then now, juries should know what percentage these people get it right and what percentage exactly. they get it wrong. Exactly. We ought to be able to so say. What the, so what about um, judges? Why so, like I can't judges say no? No more bite mark analysis in my court. Well, they should. They, they should. should. But and they don't. And why don't they? Are maybe just starting to, but. I think it's a great question. I think it's really in some ways the, the $100,000 question, why have judges um, given these kinds of forensic science sort of a free pass? And part of it is about the nature of precedent in our system. Once this kind of evidence is regularly used, you're a really busy trial judge. Mm -hmm. You might be a really busy elected trial judge who wants to be tough on crime. And this kind of evidence is presented to you that lots of other judges have admitted. and. First of all, on your own, you're probably not going to question it. That's not what judges do. Judges respond judges most of the time. Judges aren't scientists. That, and they also respond most of the time to objections and motions that are brought to mm -hmm. them. They don't say, hey, this sounds dubious to me. Even if the defense attorney does bring a motion to exclude the evidence, um, first of all, that doesn't happen all that often. Uh, defense attorneys, public defenders, are often, you know, they have very large caseloads. Yeah. They may not be well situated to bring effective defenses. Um, but even when they do, the judge looks at this and says, huh, we've been using it for a really long time. My fellow brethren have been admitting it. Maybe I used to be a prosecutor. Maybe that judge used to be a prosecutor. Maybe that judge wants to be tough on crime. He or she certainly doesn't want to let an innocent person off. And so they've tended to say, well, we'll let it in for what it's worth. So even after that 2009 report raised a lot of questions, what judges, many judges after that, they did a little bit of hand wringing. They kind of said, huh, we're surprised there's not better evidence of validity, but we'll let it in for what it's worth. We'll leave it to the jury. We'll let the jury decide. I mean, we, and, this is a system where we err on the side of conviction rather than acquittal. Well, we shouldn't be doing that, Well, right? I'm not saying we I mean, should. I'm just saying um, that's the way. But that you're saying they want to seem tough on crime. Prosecutors want to get convictions. Prosecutors certainly are not going to uh, raise a stink about this on their own, typically. No, typically they're not. And I, I would... I would really like to see judges giving this a harder look. In the federal courts, there's a case that was decided back in 1993 called Daubert versus Merrill Dow that said that federal judges had to be gatekeepers for expert evidence. And that they had the obligation of making sure that expert evidence was reliable and valid before it was admitted. And if, they, if judges took that seriously, they should require exactly the kind of foundational proof of validity that this report suggests. So you're saying there is precedent for the other way as well? There is. But There's, they're ignoring that precedent generally to go with the precedent that, that they've already established in their own courtroom. That's right. It's kind of, it's a meta principle. Like the meta principle is don't let it in unless it's valid. But now you've got to decide, is this thing valid? And 25 other people have already said yes. You don't necessarily want to take a hard look. And I mean, part of it, it's really a system problem in that, I mean, I think judges are mostly trying to do the right thing. I think defense attorneys, prosecutors, and forensic scientists are all more or less trying to do the right thing. But nobody is, um, nobody is taking seriously the responsibility to make sure that this evidence is valid before we use it. And that's what really does need to change. Are they all trying to do the right thing or are they all responding to incentives? So, I mean, uh, Prosecutors' incentive is to get convictions. They're not. They're not uh, uh, rewarded based on uh, the number of guilty people who go to jail right. versus the number of innocent people who don't. Uh, and you know, uh, um, and defendants. I mean, or uh, defense attorneys. They're uh, usually public defenders are right. so overworked that their incentive is just to churn through them. Get you know, uh, uh, and then judges. They're, they may be elected judges as well. So, I mean, it's, you know, whether doing the right thing is sort of a vague so, concept. It, we, we, we should have incentives in place so that they're motivated to not convict innocent people. Right. So I completely, of course, I completely agree with that. I mean, that's, that's fundamentally what matters here. I guess, I guess maybe saying that they're doing the right thing is one, one step being too easy on them. I guess what I mean to say is it's, it's mostly not a 
It's not a matter of bad apples or bad seeds or people committing overt malfeasance. Right. It's, it, I think prosecutors want to convict guilty people. I don't think there's, I think the number of prosecutors out there who, who would try to get a conviction against somebody they truly believed was innocent is, is you know, minuscule. But we hear that, um, you know, case of prosecutors who uh, hide evidence who, you know, I mean, maybe those are the exceptions, I, 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 but who or don't, you know, exculpatory evidence that they do not reveal to the defense. And, so there are. And in the cases we hear about, that's right. just got to be tip of the iceberg because so, there so many we don't hear about. absolutely are examples of that, yeah. no question. But I actually think the bigger, in, in some ways, those really extreme examples make it easy to ignore the fact that everyone has these institutional incentives right. and biases not to do not to truly do the right thing. You can right? point the finger at that one say, guy who did the wrong bad, thing. bad, don't do that. Instead of the larger systemic Precisely. issues that we're talking about today. So I think the larger systemic issues are actually the more important. Yeah, there's a few bad apples out there, but the real problem is that is that uh, many judges, prosecutors, and defense attorneys haven't been part of a systematic effort to ensure the quality of the evidence we're introducing. Well, what about prosecutors? How are they, I mean, they can't be ignoring, well, I guess they can't ignore it, but all the prosecutor, prosecutorial community, if there, right. such a thing exists, sure. how, what is their response, generally? Uh, their response is, I mean, generally they think that these forms of forensic science are adequately valid, and they base that on, on long use and experience. What they say is, you know, this firearms examiner has been doing this for 20 years, and they've looked at all kinds of, of you know, bullet casings. They've looked at all of these cartridges. They've done all these comparisons. A fingerprint examiner has made thousands of comparisons, and therefore we can trust them. And one of the fundamental things that this report says in no uncertain terms is that experience, even really long experience, doesn't make it scientific. That scientific requires it makes it means you've got to study it, and it means you've got to do a uh, you have to you have to look empirically at the rate of error in similar cases, and you can't just presume that because you've done it a whole lot, you're getting the right answer. That's even more true in the criminal justice system because these forensic scientists don't necessarily know they got it right. The fact somebody was convicted doesn't mean that they were right. They help produce that conviction. Yeah. So in real world cases, we don't know the ground truth. So it's not even like a bus driver who can say, I'm a good driver because I don't ever get in accidents. We don't have that kind of feedback effect right. here. But in their defense, mm -hmm. uh, lab technicians and all the people who work in these crime labs are, uh, you know, they go through lengthy, extensive training and uh, they, uh, they are vetted carefully, right? Well, they they're do, all scientists. They're all have PhDs, right? Uh, almost none of them have PhDs. Well, they, and they have they have master's degrees in science. A few do, and most of the ones who do might be. In they, have high school diploma, they, they have do. high school diplomas. They do. They have high school diplomas. diplomas. Well, that's good enough. Most for of me. them have college degrees, and these days, most of them probably do have an undergraduate degree in science. But very few of them have graduate level training in basic science. So they're not. But there's um, a rigorous training program to work in a crime lab, right? You have to go through, you know, must, must be five, ten years. Uh, study not to, not so. No? So there, there there are training programs, but there's actually no training. Whether a particular lab has training programs and what those look like depend on the. D there's the no school labs. you go to to become a lab technician. You go to work in the lab and they te they train you there. Exactly. So if the person who's been there 20 years, who's gotten all these convictions, does a crappy job, then he or she is going to train you to do the job the way they do it. Yes. I mean, these days, most forensic scientists and most forensic technicians do have an undergraduate science degree, but there's a lot. There's still a lot of on-the-job, guild-like training. And again, that isn't necessarily bad, but there's no standards governing right. this. There's no uh, no assurance that we're getting it right. So the other thing that I wanted to ask you about is sort of related is the cozy relationship often between prosecutors and the people who work in these right. labs. So uh, you would think because our justice, justice system is set up uh, to only identify the guilty and separate the guilty from the innocent and so on and so forth that the people who work in the crime in these labs would be uh, tasked with determining uh, whether there are matches or there are not matches based exclusively on what's in front of them, not based on who's 
saying in their ear, hey, we really need a conviction on this, right. or this is a really important case, or this is the, you know, we, we, we know he's guilty, but this will really seal the deal. This is a really important point, and there's two, there's two problems, and they're connected. One of them is that in most jurisdictions, crime labs are part of the prosecutorial apparatus. They're connected to law enforcement. And so um, that risks creating um, partisanship and bias, even among very good people trying well, again to do the right thing. Well, even if it's just social, because right. these are the people you socialize with at work, and you know, and you know, and then if and you if, bring come back with a result that they're not that your friend is not happy with. It's also whose side you feel like you're on. Um, so, yeah. so forensic, forensic scientists, on the one hand, feel like they've got a lot of integrity and they're on the side of justice, but they're also usually working with prosecutors, detectives, cops, and not um, having that kind of equal relationship with the defense side. <laughs> so they're never but, they're never under the uh, penumbra of the uh, defense attorney, the, uh, uh, the public no, defender's that, office. No, that, 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 yeah, that would look a lot different, wouldn't yeah, it? Yeah, I bet it would. Um, the other problem, and it's it's related, but it's it's worth distinguishing, is that you, you kind of mentioned that somebody might be whispering in the, their ear. There are a lot of crime labs that don't shield examiners from having other information about the case. So um, if you're doing a forensic comparison, there's really no reason you need to know that the suspect has three priors for similar uh -huh. kinds of crimes, right. or that without this you're not likely to get a conviction, or that the main other witness was drunk and wasn't wearing his glasses and can't be relied upon. And in th there, this is changing a little bit, and some labs have gone, have 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 done good work to try to shield their examiners from this, but many don't. And there's all of this evidence that we are susceptible, all of us as humans, we're susceptible to cognitive bias. And, and you know, you, you know when you're testing a new pharmaceutical product, how when a doctor does... You don't mean me personally, do you? I don't mean, yeah, I'm not asking you know? about that. You know right, about exactly, that? that's, your, that's your own business. Yes, um, private time. But when, when you're doing a... My own a, scientific a, experiment. A, a, a clinical, a, a controlled study, you don't even tell the doctor who's getting the placebo and who's right. not. There's a, there's a, there's a reason it's called that's, double blind. That's right, and there's no blinding, or there, there's no routine blinding right now in forensic science, and there really ought to be. There's just there's no, no reason. reason why the people who are doing the experiments or conducting the, the labs on these various samples and whatever they are should have any idea. That's right. What, uh, you know, they, I mean, that's, that's not pertinent to their job. They should know everything they need to do to do their job, and they should know nothing about the case beyond what they need to know right. to do their job. Um, so, in you know, not researching, but thinking about this, I did some I did some research online about other cases where uh, issues with crime labs, not just the bite mark analysis being off, but there there are all sorts of different uh, issues in crime labs. Uh, and one of them, I read a slate piece by Mark Stern that apparently the ACLU of Massachusetts is is calling for 24,000 plus convictions to be overturned because of a uh, state forensics drug lab technician, I believe a graphic was named Annie Dukin, mm -hmm. uh, who falsified tens of thousands of reports, often marking results as positive without testing a substance. When whistleblowers reported Dukin, the lab silenced them, then covered up her misconduct. Over her nine-year career, Dukin tainted the convictions of tens of thousands of people, most of them poor, a majority of them charged with mere possession, and then coerced into plea deals. Uh, and then, but that's, that's just one in Massachusetts. Also in Massachusetts, the next graphic we have, meanwhile, a second Massachusetts crime lab scandal looms. Sonia Frank, a former employee at the Amherst Crime Lab with duties similar to Dukin's, was convicted of regularly stealing drug samples and conducting analyses while blazingly high on crack cocaine, methamphetamine, amphetamine, ketamine, ecstasy, and LSD. Frank's egregious misconduct may have tainted up to 18,000 cases. And I apologize for any grammatical uh, errors. I was scrambling to get the graphics done uh, in time while still fanboying over Joss Whedon. Yes, and, well, understandable. Uh, uh, Susan Sarandon. Um, uh, and then one more, I got one more. Uh, a, a Joyce Gilchrist was a former forensic chemist who had participated in over 3,000 criminal cases in 21 years while working for the Oklahoma City Police Department and who was accused of falsifying evidence. Her evidence led in part to 23 people being sentenced to death, 11 of whom have been executed. Gilchrist earned the nickname Black Magic for her ability to match DNA evidence that other forensic examiners could not. She was also known for being unusually adept at testifying and persuading juries, thus obtaining convictions. So. And that's just, you know, that's just and the last are, year and, the, you know, randomly sort of searching around. And you you must know found, dozens right, of other examples. Right. You could have found so many more. There's so quite a few scandals. The quality control is 
uh, non-existent. You wouldn't tolerate this kind of quality control in the pet department at Walmart. Yes, well, uh, uh, you know, there's not, um, again, there's not, there's not necessarily the kind of testing and standards that we'd expect, but these are examples of bad apples, right? There are bad apples out there, and there's a lot more than the ones you mentioned. Right. And it's a real problem, and it's partly a problem that's produced by the partisanship that we were talking about, the fact that, that you can get a lot of kudos for getting the detectives and the prosecutors the results that they want. And that does lead some examiners to go dramatically too far, right? There's I mean, no at the, question. the office Christmas um, party, they're all together and they're right. celebrating. And if I'm a prosecutor and I didn't get the conviction on that uh, that I wanted because the crime, the, the lab, crime lab couldn't lab, get you the result. Yeah. There's, there's even a term for it, dry labbing. Right? Dry, dry labbing. labbing is when you, you don't even do the test that you report. And so we, we have a word for it. it um, but at the same time, I kind of, kind of, you know, like, I'm um, sorry, we're going to have to discipline you. We caught you and your coworker dry labbing, and that's <laughs> unacceptable during off hours. Uh, right, it sounds So uh, what, what, what does that mean? Does that mean just do, not doing the tests, or? Yes, it means falsely reporting tests you didn't even do. Okay. Like, you didn't even have to. You're not even falsifying you, results. You, you didn't, didn't even, even bother. get your hands wet. You're like, you didn't too lazy get, right. to be that's right. <laughs> incompetent. That's right. But I guess, I guess I would reiterate that while I do think that's a real problem, and there's, I mean, you, you were picking on Massachusetts a little bit there, too, there, but there's so many other examples. Right, there was know. another one in New Jersey. There, there, uh, West I mean, Virginia, yeah. I mean, you, the list goes on, San Francisco, I mean, you, there, there's no state that's been totally exempt. But what it's really part of is a broader cultural problem that we haven't made it a culture of science. We haven't created a research culture inside forensic science. We haven't made, we haven't created a culture where you get points for asking, what can't I know? What don't I know? What do I need to do more testing about before I can make a claim? And that, I think, is actually an even bigger problem than these bad apples. But, and I think there's an even larger cultural problem, which I was reminded of during the, now we have this, this president, you may know there's a presidential election going on. And uh, Donald Trump, like a month or two ago, uh, he, the, the, the famous car, par, case of the Central Park Five, right. who he said were guilty and they should be executed. And then later on, they were, you know, and they confessed, and you right. know, later on it turned out they didn't do it at all. And Donald Trump to this day still thinks they should be go, yes. go to prison, he says. He, he, still to this day, says this, even though they were exonerated. And that, I think, is the perfect, that exemplifies the cultural problem we face, which is, that, you know, who are the people who are the 24,000 cases that need to be, re, you know, revisited in Massachusetts? Right. They're are probably they, are not they people, people from uh, Beacon Hill? Are they the you know the top ten percent of the class at Deerfield? Right. You know, no. They are black and brown and underprivileged, uh, poor, uh, just generally underserved communities who do not have the resources to challenge any of this. They're better off plea bargaining. Maybe they don't even know their rights. Illegal immigrants. Uh, you know, all, people. Uh, countless people who've been deported based on faulty DNA or forensic evidence. And there's no. There's no making up for that. And all these people who are in prison, even if you do revisit them, all these cases and uh, set a lot of them free, or a lot of these people are just, they're out of prison now because they were relatively minor offenses and now they can't get jobs because they have a felony conviction on their record and they can't vote if they live in Florida and so on and so forth. So. Um, that's the, how do, you know, what do we do about that? Yeah, no, I mean, that's, you're, that captures some of the very real world consequences of this for human beings whose lives can be turned upside down in ways that they in no way deserve. If and they that's didn't do that, they're matters. probably guilty of something. Right, well, and that, there, you, that, that, you do sometimes hear that. You do absolutely sometimes hear that. And you're, of course, absolutely right that you're likelier to be caught in this problematic matrix if you don't have resources, if you don't yeah. have the ability to get a lawyer, you know, a very good lawyer from the moment that that you are um, you're wrongly accused of something. If you if you don't know if you talk to the police and and for hours and hours and hours of interrogation until finally you uh, you give a false confession. Right. right. So so you're absolutely right that these dangers are not distributed evenly across society. And, and, that's there, and you know, just thinking about this, this is just one corner, right. if you call it that, uh, piece of the pie of the criminal justice pie of the breakdown in our system where people who are innocent are convicted of crimes. And I was thinking, I just made a list off the top of my head of the other ways that we've got faulty eyewitness testimony, right. which we people come to believe is foolproof, right. and we know that it's not. And you've got maybe maybe the person's looking at a lineup and the, the police officer says, uh, do you see the, the take, person who did it right. here? Take another you, look at number you, two. You know, yeah, you know what right. my favorite number is? Four right. is yeah. a good number. Um, uh, the plea bargains, you, where they, they didn't do anything, but they say, oh, listen, you're gonna go to jail for 20 years, you better, you know, um, Coerced confessions, like you talk about, I mean, you just wear them down, or they're young, 
Right. Oh, these kids, in, I saw in 60 Minutes or something, these kids in Texas, can, uh, you right. know, they, uh, they confessed to a crime of murdering somebody in a pizza. They've never been to that pizza in their right. lives. Um, planted evidence. I mean, this is something that we don't want to admit that happens or cops committing perjury, but we, we're seeing now. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, Walter Scott in uh, South, that South Carolina, yeah, where he's, I mean, the, the cop shoots him and then plants the taser right. on him and says, oh, he tried to, you know. Um, uh, or just generally trumped up charges, uh, or people who can't afford bail. I mean, there's okay. just, and you know, they wind up just serving these lengthy prison terms because they can, before they even go to trial. That's right. Jailhouse snitches are another Jailhouse big, big snitches, cause. Jailhouse snitches, exactly. A, yeah. uh, you've just kind of described, I teach at UCLA Law School where I'm dean, I teach a, uh, a, a an elective for first year law students. It's a one credit elective on, it's an introduction to wrongful convictions. And you've just kind of named my syllabus. Well, so, so this, but this is my question to you about this is, that there's a joke about like, oh, you know, prisons are full of innocent, or people, you know, proclaim their innocence. And it's a joke because, of course, they're all really guilty, right? Well, maybe they're not. Some of them aren't. And it's not just some of them. It's probably, a, you know, a substantial, I mean, our, our we have everything, uh, <laughs> everything is tilted in against them, right. against these people, so that if, if there's any breakdown, they're going to go to jail. There's not like you know, it, it's not all these people getting off on technicalities. Not everybody is an alley north. Right. So these people are not getting off on technicalities. So we don't have great data on how many wrongful convictions there are. It's a really hard thing yeah. to know. It's kind of epistemically uncertain. There have been efforts to try to estimate, but you can criticize those efforts. What we do know, and I mean, this is actually a piece of good news within this really distressing story. One of the reality, one of the things that did result um, from DNA testing is that it was we were able to pretty definitively show the existence of wrongful convictions. Mm -hmm. And so right. it has led to broader awareness among judges, prosecutors, defense attorneys, and the public that this set of problems exists. And so there's at least an openness to reform that we didn't see um, 20 years ago. They, could, they always had plausible deniability. They could, they could always claim, oh, well, you know, but the DNA doesn't lie. Right. Well, and I mean, I think that's right. I think that, that, that is that DNA, especially, you know, single sample DNA or mixed sample when there's two known sources, it's a really authoritative right. form of knowledge. If you and say, so, if the, <laughs> we're saying, you know, the people versus you, and we're saying that you raped that person, that's right. and the semen sample comes back as not from you, it's it, pretty it's persuasive pretty that persuasive. it wasn't you. So, you know, Ray Crone, to name just one case, a guy who was convicted basically entirely on the basis of a bite mark, a bite mark and the fact that he had very casual knowledge of the person who died. And his, he, 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 had, he was called the snaggle tooth killer because he had uneven teeth and they were said to match. Mm -hmm. And it was really the bite mark and virtually nothing else that got him convicted. But when the DNA showed otherwise, he was released. And so, I mean, that's just one example among hundreds, but that has brought attention to the reality that wrongful convictions are a real phenomenon. And the first step toward improving the situation is actually, I feel like I sound like, like you know, this is supposed to be AA or something. The first step is acknowledging sure. the problem. Yeah. But it really is. The first step is acknowledging the problem and um, recognizing that, that we, even though we have a system that's a, that has a presumption of innocence, even though we do provide everyone accused of a felony with a public defender, there's gaping gaps and holes in our system that sometimes prevent us from doing justice. Well, and another one of the steps is making amends. And a lot of these people, we can't make amends for them, but we should be making it, but we should at least try. But prosecutors, many of them are reluctant to even revisit these cases. So it seems like that's that's almost intractable so, also. So some are and some aren't. I'm getting you know, a little upset here. Angry. Yeah, I know. I well, and, and there's a lot to it's be. It's not your angry. fault. No, I'm, I'm not holding you responsible. There's a lot to be angry about. What I will say, I mean, just take prosecutors' offices. There are some that have really that have created offices of conviction integrity review that have tried to create devil's advocate processes to prevent cognitive bias and tunnel vision that are taking much more seriously than they did some decades ago their duty and responsibility to try to think more about is there some chance this person could be innocent before they go down the path of of uh, prosecuting them. So, um, you know, I don't want to, I really, there are bad apple, there are potential bad apples across the system, but I don't want to demonize any mm -hmm. one category of player. I, I do, mean, I actually do, but okay. Who do you want to demonize? Uh, who's the Who's the bad guy? <laughs> God damn prosecutors. All right, well, uh, so. No, it's personal but, with me. Right, no, but, okay. but, the, but you, I mean, you, I want to close with some sort of hope, right. uh, Ray of Hope. And what you're talking about is something that is. Find the is, glimmer. Well, but this is right. turning, turning a battleship around. I mean, it's a right. huge, 
uh, undertaking to get judges, prosecutors, and the general public, and every, you know, to acknowledge that this, the, the way we thought the world was working is not the way we, uh, it's actually working, and now we have to make a change uh, so that we don't keep doing this and keep convicting innocent people. And uh, you're saying there are some prosecutors who are uh, uh, open to that. Very much. And what are, so what are the other reforms that one seems to be decoupling the crime labs from the prosecutor's offices? Is that realistic? Um, a few jurisdictions have done that. Um, it has not been spreading like wildfire. I wish it would. So I don't think it's completely unrealistic. I mean, D.C. made its crime lab independent. Some other places have as well. Um, but it's certainly, it, it's not everywhere. Um, I, I have to say, I mean, so it's, it's sort of the good news, bad news story. I was a little bit um, disheartened by some of the responses to this report, um, the, the District Attorney Association came out with a press release that you know kind of had swords out saying, nonsense, nonsense, who are these people to question what we're doing? Uh -huh. um, and I found that pretty disheartening. But I will also say... This was the glimmer of hope portion. I know, I know, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Okay, but, okay. but what I will also say is that the, even the existence of reports like this are a glimmer of hope. The fact that the this, the that the core of the scientific community, not just law professors, not just forensic scientists, not, I'm sorry, not just law professors, not just defense attorneys, not just, um, you know, critics, but, but mainstream geneticists, physicists, leading scientists are willing to come out and say, we think we have a problem here, may be a very positive step toward change. Um, and I also think that, that judges are one of the keys here, that judges need to recognize that when, um, when defendants bring challenges to these kinds of evidence, those challenges need to be taken very seriously. And the fact that a number of judges were willing to be part of this advisory group one judge, Judge Alex Kaczynski on the Ninth Circuit. Oh, he I love wrote, him. He's he, the best. He, he wrote an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal, I think about the same day that my op-ed with Judge Harry Edwards of the D.C. Circuit came out in the Washington Post. And, you know, Alex Kaczynski called some of this voodoo science. Right. Um, and so when a handful of leading judges are beginning to say, wait a minute, we have a real problem here, they have the power to bring about very positive change. So we're, there's, it's possible we are close to a tipping point where it seems like you, you have to have those first few judges who take a leadership That's role right. and saying, I'm going to change the way I run my courtroom, even though precedent says, in my own courtroom, I've done it differently. I'm going to acknowledge, I'm going to accept new information, which is what we're asking you to do. Right. Uh, and, uh, and that will hopefully... Exactly. You know, I mean, and here's just a couple a, more examples. Tidal wave of change. A couple more glimmers of hope for that tidal wave. The, in Texas, the Texas Commission on Forensic Science had a, they declared a moratorium on bite mark evidence. Mm. That was. A, and that's Texas. That's Texas. Exactly. I mean, they'll execute you on that. You, you would not hat, have expected you know. Texas to be at the forefront of that. Um, and bite marks in general, I think we're beginning to see broad recognition that bite mark evidence really does not have a place in the courtroom. So there are glimmers of hope, okay. but we have a long way to go. I think that go. the and also we have to, as the larger culture, uh, stop viewing people from underclass and brown people as much more likely, uh, uh, you know, as the criminal element. And I mean that's a that's a much harder thing to do overall. But uh, I feel like we have we, you know, we have the power. The, potential to do that. I think we do have the potential to do that and then to bring it just back to forensic science, I also think we have the potential to not, we, we should question when somebody says they're absolutely sure of something and that the reason they know is because they've been doing it for a really long time and they're never wrong, ask, say, show me the evidence, show me the proof that you actually can do what you say you can do. And if we just went around kind of saying, show me the evidence, we could, we could make a lot of progress. Unfortunately, there. we have leadership in this country who are science averse, so they're not setting a good precedent for the rest of us. This is the glimmer of hope but, portion. Right, I'm sorry, I forgot. <laughs> uh, well, you know, here's one thing that I want to suggest uh, for our viewers. If you are ever on a jury, and you're in a courtroom where this kind of evidence is introduced as uh, watertight, right. then you, you have the power to, to question that yourself. That's exactly right. And you so there's, I mean, we can all make individual changes uh, that have ripple effects, especially, and if it just changes the, the impact on one person's life who doesn't get convicted because you're on a jury and you question it and they don't have any other evidence to back up that bite mark, exactly. then this will have been worthwhile. And hopefully there's more than that, but even so, and personally, uh, if I'm on a jury, not that they would ever let me on one, yeah. uh, this is something I'm going to want to keep in mind and because it's, it, it's, reading it was just, it was outrageous. And it's made me so angry uh, that in so many ways our criminal justice system is hopelessly flawed. 
And this is just one way. And taken as the big picture, it's something we should all be angry about. I tremendously appreciate the chance to talk about this, and I would absolutely agree that viewers, if you are on juries, um, just because something calls itself science, ask hard questions. Don't just don't just presume that it's true because the expert says it is. And don't give in to the pressure of the other jurors who say, "Come on, he's science. He's you know he's a he was wearing a lab coat. It's got to be true." That's right. Go watch that's... Twelve Angry Men. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. All right. Well, thank you very much to right. Jennifer Manukin for uh, coming in. And we're waiting through Susan Sarandon and Joss Whedon and yak, 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 that Jank Uger. He just will talk forever. <laughs> um, and, you know, the next time, you know, so go out and get her book. Yeah. It's a Report <laughs> to the Prison, Forensic right. Science and <laughs> Criminal Courts, Ensuring Scientific Validity of Feature Comparison Methods. When, you're, when you have your next book out, please come and plug that too. Yes, well, this one I'm I'm just an advisor, just an advisor. but uh, but it's it, it it is it's it's worth reading at least the beginning. It's a and, quick read. It's a um, quick read. Exactly. Beach read. B bedtime reading. Read over, just just over have it by your night Thanksgiving stand. holiday. So uh, I hope this has been edifying for you. It was important for me to do this, which is why I did it myself, uh, and to make sure it happened and to share this with you because it outraged me. I hope you're outraged also, and that this will do some good. Uh, in our little corner of the world. Thank with you. The thank you, Malcolm, and thank you for having me. Thanks a lot. It was it's great. Been, I really enjoyed it. I really yeah, appreciate it's, it. It's been a pleasure right, getting to talk about this. Thanks.